I'll be walking down the King Highway. Tell me the old, old story. I love it better every day. Hallelujah. I will take my sins all the way. Page 15, the gospel melody. I kind of goofed up there. My eye glasses got all blind. Page number 15 in your chorus book. You find one in the song book. Okay, number 15, a top song. Every day with Jesus, I'll be walking in the bloodstained way.
Good evening, everybody. The Memorick, I'll be doing the Memorick this evening. The Memorick is Lamentations 3, 21 through 26. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Is there anyone else ready tonight? Joshi? Lamentation 3, 21 through 26. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassion is family. They are new every morning, and great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Good job. Anyone else ready tonight? Brother Greg? Lamentations 3, verses 21 through 26. This I, recall to, um, this I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, and great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Good job. Is there anyone else ready tonight? Ezekiel? Good job. Anyone else ready tonight? Dakota? This time we call to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great is thy Good job. Anyone else ready tonight? Miss Anna? Lamentations 3, verses 21 through 26. This I recall to my mind, therefore, have I hoped. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassion is not. They are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that seek to wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Good job. Anyone else ready to know? Bethany? Lamentations 3, 21 through 26. This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. There you every morning, great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Good job. Anyone else ready tonight? Tabitha? Good job. 
Anyone else ready tonight? Justin? Good job. Anyone else ready tonight? Summer. Good job. Anyone else ready tonight? Brother Jake? Good job. Anyone else ready tonight? Brady? Good job. Anyone else ready tonight? Daddy? Lamentation 3, 21 to 26. This I recall to my mind before I might hope. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because his, because his compassion failed not. They are new every morning, great as I think. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope The Lord is good unto them that wait for me, the soul that seeketh. It's good that a man should hold hope and quietly wait for salvation. Good job. Anyone else ready tonight? Miss Lynn? Lamentations 3, 21 through 26. These are recalled to my mind. Therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that were not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning, great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them. Seek and for the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and fight the day for the salvation of the Lord. Good job. Anyone else ready tonight? Lamentations 3, 21 through 26. This I recall in my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fell not. There you every morning, great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul, therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, the soul that seek in him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Good job. Anyone else ready tonight? If not, then open your Bibles to Lamentations 3. Look down to verse 21. Reading along, pausing at the punctuation marks, the Bible says, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. 
They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. All right, thank you, Noah, for that. Great participation, church. Many of us have regrets in our lives. None of us will ever regret spending time memorizing or reading God's Word. Come with me tonight to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And when you found your place there, I ask that you stand with me, please, and honor the reading of the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'll begin reading in your hearing in verse number 50. As we are approaching the end of the chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll begin reading, and you're hearing in verse number 50, read down through verse number 53. I encourage you to have your Bible, hold your Bible, follow along in your Bible as I read aloud in your hearing. Hear the words, see the words, believe the words, and by the grace of God, and the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit, together we will do the words. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse number 50. Church, this is the Word of God. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. I want to preach tonight on this subject. We shall all be changed. If you are saved, you will not always be the way you are now. A change is coming. A glorious change is coming. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for the goodness of God. We thank you for the privilege, the opportunity, and the responsibility that we have as God's people to assemble ourselves together, to meet together, to feast on the good word of God. I thank you for the privilege tonight of being able to sing, join in, in chorus and congregational singing praises to your worthy name, being encouraged and exhorted by the singing. We thank you for the privilege of praying. And then, Lord, tonight... As we turn our attention to the Word of God, the preaching of it, the teaching of it, we pray that the Holy Spirit of God would do, perform His ministry, His all-important ministry of teaching us and leading us and guiding us into all truth, illuminating our minds, revealing to us truths that can be found nowhere outside of the Word of God. Thank you for a Bible tonight. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And you may be seated. We shall all be changed. Our text provides for us enlightenment. It provides excitement. And it, and it provides encouragement. And we'll seek to handle each of these individually in the coming weeks. For this message, our focus is to be on enlightenment. In the preceding verses, Paul has been describing the difference between our mortal bodies and our resurrection bodies. Our mortal bodies, of course, are the ones that we live in now, and our resurrection bodies are the ones that are promised us when we leave this life, either by death and ultimate resurrection, or by rapture at the coming again of Jesus Christ. Both of these can be called the resurrection because Paul would reveal to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that these two things happen at the same time. They happen simultaneously. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord caught up together to meet with them and to meet the Lord in the clouds. And so these two things happen simultaneously. And so he's talking about the difference uh, in the verses that lead up to our text today between our mortal bodies and our resurrection bodies, and he has used the physical to aid in our understanding of the spiritual. 
He's used the analogy of grain, the diversities of bodies, and then the natural and the spiritual. To this point, he's used things that are observable. They miss them. Those that he's writing to primarily miss them. And the truth is, we often miss them, but they are observable. And things that are observable do tell us something about God, about His nature, about His character, about His being, about who He is. Uh, the observable world does teach us something about God, the planting of seed and the subsequent growing of that which was planted, the various forms of bodies, man, beast, fishes, birds, the sun, the moon, the stars, all of which are observable. And he has used these observables, if you will, to aid in our understanding of the unobservable. In fact, he sums up all of this by saying in verse number 44, there is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. But now in our text for today, he moves into truths that have been to the, up to this point unknown and unknowable. And that's because... They are unobservable in the natural order. He says this in verse number 51. Look at it with me. Behold, I show you a mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, it's a mystery because up to this point, God has not revealed it. That's what makes it a mystery. But he's about to change all of that because Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, when you show someone a mystery, the mystery ceases to be a mystery because you've showed it to them, right? And so Paul says, behold, or look, or pay attention, I'm showing you what has up to this point been a mystery. Remember what Paul says back in 1 Corinthians 1.21 where he says, the world by wisdom knew not God. The world by wisdom knew not God. The things of God can only be known, certainly known, through revelation. Now, how can we know God certainly? Through what means? Revelation. Y'all help me now. I'm giving you the answer, then I'm asking you the question. If you get it wrong, that's on you. It can only be known, certainly, things can only certainly be known of God through revelation. That is, God has to reveal them to us. God has to reveal himself to us. Wisdom cannot find out God. The world by wisdom knew not God. When in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them which believed. The world by wisdom knew not God. Science will never find God. I think they've gotten close. I think they've seen God's fingerprints in some things. They've seen God's signature in some things. They've seen God's stamp on some things, more so as science has evolved, and about the only thing that evolves is science, not people, amen. Science eventually will catch up with the Bible. It hasn't yet, it's not even close yet, but in the areas that it has, they see God's fingerprint, they see God's signature, they see God's stamp, and it scares a lot of them. Some of them get saved. Some of them become creation, the, uh, creationists cre and they practice creationism. They become uh, intelligent design goons or whatever you want to call them. Uh, but they stop short of confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hey, getting close to, be, to being saved isn't good enough. Assenting that, yes, there's something wrong with evolution, but, and there's something to this whole intelligent design thing, that's not enough. It's a good start, but it's not enough. Ask King Agrippa. Almost, thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Almost. Almost saved is all the way lost. Things that... God can, the things of God can only be known, that is certainly known through revelation, and for that reason, until they are revealed, they are called mysteries. They're called mysteries until God shows them to us, and then the mystery ceases to be. And that's, what, that's why our text provides enlightenment, because here Paul says, I show you a mystery. And really, that's what the Word of God does. It gives us enlightenment. 
We go to the Bible to know about God, to learn who God is, to learn who we are, and to learn our relation or lack thereof to God. That's what the Bible does to us. It opens our eyes. It gives us light. Apart from the Bible, you and I can think, we can guess, we can formulate opinions, we can hypothesize, we can theorize, but we cannot know. Not apart from the Bible, we can never know God. It's God's Word that gives us enlightenment. Now, David would say in the 19th Psalm, the heavens declare the what? Glory of God. So you can maybe know something a little bit about God, like His glory, but you cannot know God unless He reveals Himself to you. And He reveals Himself to me. That's the only way to know God. Apart from the Bible, we cannot know Him. It's God's Word that gives us enlightenment. The psalmist says it this way in Psalm 119, 105, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Where does the lamp and the light come from? The Word of God. That is, when you open this, honey, it's got more than 900 lumens, Brother Don. It's a spotlight right into the soul of man, right into the heart of man. And it reveals to us God. Uh, Solomon says in Proverbs 6, 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light. You know, when the law comes in, the lights come on. The law is a light. That's why the law is so important. The law of God, the Ten Commandments, and the law as it, re as it is used to, de to describe and to depict the entirety of the Word of God. It's a light. It turns the lights on. People can live in darkness their whole life. If you never open your Bible, you'll be in the dark. And the only light that you have in your life is the light that comes from divine revelation through the Word of God as it's illuminated to us by the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so enlightenment comes from revelation as God reveals truth and truths to us through His Word. Now, as we look at this enlightenment that results from the revealed mystery here in our text, we see first enlightenment concerning our problem. Enlightenment concerning our problem. Look with me first at verse number 50. Paul says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Now, do you see a problem there? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Do you want to go to heaven when you die? So what's the problem? What are you made out of? Flesh and blood. And so he's saying here, flesh and blood can't go to heaven. He cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Look at verse number 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And the lesson is this. We are not fit. We are not suitable for heaven as we are. Is everybody okay with that? We're not suitable for heaven as we are. Even though we are saved. I'm saved. I thought getting saved made me suitable for heaven. Not yet. Not yet. Even though we are saved, even though we have been born again, we cannot enter heaven in our current state. Paul reveals this, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Our bodies, our earthly tabernacles, are not suited for the kingdom of God. They're not. This will never go to heaven. I will go to heaven. You can't see me right now. You can only see the tabernacle that I'm living in. You can only see the body that I'm living in. But you can't see me. I'm in here. I'm right here. <laughs> I'm using this body to try to get your attention. But... You can't see the body. Now, I don't want to diverge too much. And I'm thinking about how much to diverge. I'll save it. Our bodies are not suited for the kingdom of God because they are, number one, tainted. They are tainted. What has tainted our bodies? Sin. The curse that came because sin entered the world. Sin has led to corruption to dishonor, and to weakness. Back in verse number 42, he says, speaking of our physical body, it is sown in what? Corruption. And, again, and in verse 43, he says, it is sown in dishonor, 
And again, it is sown in weakness. In verse 50, he again uses the word corruption. Then in verse 54, corruptible. Sin has rendered our bodies, our flesh and blood, unsuitable for heaven. And we see this truth declared in John 6, 63, where the Lord Jesus says, The flesh profiteth nothing. The flesh profiteth nothing. And again in Romans 7, 18, where Paul says, In me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And then in Romans 8, 8, he says, They that are in the flesh cannot please God. Our bodies are not suited for heaven because they are, because they are tainted. They are tainted. Then, too, we see that our bodies are not suited for the kingdom of God because they are temporary. Not only is my body tainted, that's bad news, it's also temporary. Paul describes our bodies the way they are now in verse 53 as mortal. These sin-tainted bodies are not designed to last forever. They are destined to die. They are temporary. In 2 Corinthians 5, 1, he talks about our earthly house of this tabernacle being dissolved. Dissolved. He refers to our bodies in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 as earthen vessels. The Bible tells us in Genesis 2, 7 that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And Elihu says in Job 34, 15, all flesh shall perish together, and man shall turn again unto dust. He's going to turn again unto dust. Peter says in, in 2 Peter 1, 13 and 14, Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle. Peter described his body as a tabernacle under inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He said, Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, remembrance knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. Shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. And so uh, here Peter speaks of his body as a tabernacle, a kind of tent or temporary shelter, and he defines death as the putting off of this tabernacle, of this temporary tabernacle. Our bodies are temporary. They're not built to last forever. How many of you needed me to tell you that tonight? Or how many of you had already kind of figured that out? That if yours was built to last forever, there must be a recall somewhere. Because it ain't turning out that way. Our bodies are temporary. They're not built to last forever. And so we see that in our current condition. We are not suited to the kingdom of God because our bodies are tainted and because they are temporary. And so we see enlightenment concerning our problem as Paul says first in verse 50, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood shall, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Then in verse 53, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Now I have a theory that I think is strongly rooted in the Word of God. It's not clearly stated, so I don't think it's all that important, but it is, I think, there. And that is when God, what did God form man of? The dust of the ground, right? And then he said man is going to return to the dust from whence he was taken. I wonder if that wasn't always part of the plan of God. I wonder if it wasn't that God, and I usually don't do this, I'm just going to do it a little bit, and I'm not going to go too deep in it, at least not now. And I've mentioned this before, that God intended Adam and Eve to live 1,000 years in these bodies and then to graduate into something else. What do I base that on? Because we're headed toward a literal 1,000-year reign in which Jesus Christ will come to planet Earth. And people will live in their natural bodies, not us, 
But people will live during the millennial kingdom in their natural bodies 1,000 years, during the 1,000-year reign. And then they'll lay down those natural bodies. Those that, uh, that are saved will graduate. They will get a glorified body like you and I will have during that time. And those that are not saved during that time that are born unto those that are saved that enter to begin with, is that a mouthful, is that too much? Uh, will be, Satan will be loosed after a thousand years in captivity with the bottomless pit and the chain wrapped around him that the angel put on him. He'll be loosed for a season to deceive the nations. And he'll go out to deceive them and those that he deceives will be as the number, uh, 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 in number as the sand which is by the seashore, innumerable. Why 1,000 year reign? Why not a 10,000 year reign? Why not a 100 year reign? Why reign at all? Why millennial kingdom at all? Why? Why not just go straight from dying and going to heaven? I mean, that's the way most preachers preach it today. If they preach anything anymore at all, they preach that you die and go to heaven. There's not a lot of preaching on the 1,000 year reign of Christ anymore. It's like we've cut that out of the Bible. And they just go straight from here to heaven to the eternal state. That's not what the Bible does. There's a thousand-year reign for a reason. And the reason of the thousand-year reign is so that man can fulfill God's original purpose. By the way, God's promise is everything God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it that men may fear before him. Everything that God starts, he finishes. You'll never find anything that God started that he didn't finish or that he will not finish. And in the thousand-year reign, he's going to finish what he started in the Garden of Eden. God is going to end the way he began with man living for 1,000 years in a body made of the dust of the ground. But this time, man is not going to sin. This time, Jesus has already, the second Adam has already come. The curse has been lifted from the earth. We live on a different earth during the millennial kingdom than the one we see today. It's not the new heaven and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. That doesn't come until Revelation 21 after the thousand-year reign. That's when the new city cometh down from God out of heaven, new Jerusalem, adorned as a bride for a husband, But there is a 1,000-year reign, and why is it there? For God to finish what he started in the Garden of Eden. God is going to finish what he started. God finishes everything that he starts. The seven-year period is to call Israel back to himself. The 1,000-year reign is for God to set up his earthly kingdom. And then we enter the eternal state after the millennium. And so we see here in our text enlightenment concerning our problem. And then, too, we see here in our text enlightenment concerning God's promise. Look with me in verses 51 and 52. Behold, Paul says, I show you a mystery, enlightenment concerning God's promise. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now here's where the mystery, the mystery comes in. And remember, it's only a mystery because up to this point, God has not yet revealed it. That's the only reason it's a mystery. The things of God can only be known, known for certain through revelation. We ought not to think of God as mysterious, as out there somewhere as unknown or as unknowable. Certainly, we can't figure God out. But God is not a mystery for us for one all-important reason. He's revealed himself to us. Hey, I know God. I know him. I know him personally. He's not a mystery to me. We have a relationship. We have fellowship. There are times when I can sense his presence in my life. There are times, Brother Ron, when I can clearly see his hand working in my life and recognize that it's God doing it in real time, not, not just looking back. Oh, I can look back and see it a lot of times that I missed it during the time, but there are times, Sister Patty, when I can sense God working in my life in real time when he's doing it. 
and praise him and thank him for what he's doing while he's doing it. God is not a mystery to me anymore. Why? Because on April the 2nd of 1996, he showed himself to me. Now, he was a great mystery to me before that, a mystery that I didn't think about, care about, care to explore. I had no questions about it until the days leading up to my grandpa's funeral after his death, between his death and his funeral. Then I was full of questions that had no answers. And then on April the 2nd of 1996, the very day of the funeral, God showed himself to me. God showed up at the funeral. And he revealed himself to me, by the way, through his word. Through his word. As the preacher preached the gospel. And I heard and believed. We can't figure out God. But God is not a mystery because he's revealed himself to us and he's done this through the Bible. Paul says it this way in Romans 1, 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein, therein, the gospel of Christ, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. That's the word. Therein, in the gospel of Christ, in the word of God, therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, how do I know that salvation is by faith? Is it because it's the way that makes the most sense? Honey, if it was the way that makes the most sense, most religions would believe that salvation is by faith, and they don't. It's not the way that makes the most sense, at least not to our minds, our fallen minds, our corruptible minds, then why do I believe that salvation is by faith? Because I want to be different than the majority and go against the grain? No. Then why do I believe salvation is by faith? Because the Bible has revealed it to me. God, through His Word, has turned the light on to the way to be saved, and it is through faith. That's how I know it. That's how I know it. How do I know that when this body dies? Now, I don't know how I'll die, and you don't know how you'll die. I know how some people have died in car wrecks and house fires. There was a, a dear lady that was a friend of my mama. She's dead now, died of brain cancer. But before she died, she had kids. And when I was a kid, she had kids she, in her house there in Galena Park caught on fire. And one of her kids was trapped in the house and burned to death. What about those people? What about those people that uh, were out in the ocean, got eaten by sharks? And that, that, that happens. And that's happened. What about those people? How are they going to be raised from the dead? How can I know that a body that's mangled, that's burnt, that's reduced to ash through cremation or any other way, how do I know that those bodies, if those people were saved, are going to be raised from the dead? How do I know that? Because it makes sense? Because I've got it figured out? because I understand enough about anatomy and about physiology to kind of wrap my brain around how it all works? No, because the Bible says it, because God has revealed it to me in His Word. I know it for one reason, and I know it one way, and that is through revelation. God has told us in His Word exactly what's going to happen. That's how I know. John says it this way in 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. How do I know I have eternal life? By the way, I do know that. How do I know that? God told me. Yeah, yeah. I know some things because you told me. And just because you told me, I believe it. And then I know some things that you couldn't tell me. And even if you did, I probably wouldn't believe you. But God told me, and I believe him. I don't believe that I'm saved because some preacher or some Christian told me that I was saved. I believe it because God said it. God said it. He revealed it to me through His Word. He, in fact, He said, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, that's the contingency that you may know. I've written so that you can know. God wrote this whole book so that the whole world could know. And so the mystery is revealed. And the mystery that is revealed is this. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. That people die is not a mystery. It happens all the time and always has since sin entered into the world. 
But the mystery that God is revealing here through Paul is this. Not all believers will die. He calls it sleep here. After having given the analogy of grain and the diversities of bodies and the contrast of the natural and the spiritual body, all of which is part of his response to the questions in verse number 35, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Paul then goes on to reveal that what has heretofore been a mystery, and it's this, though death is the obvious door to the new body, it's not the only door to the new body. And by the way, death is not the end. Again, he says, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We shall all be changed. It means to be transformed. Somebody said, are you sure you're going to go to heaven when you die? I said, honey, I may not even die. I mean, you need to change your wording. I may not even die. I may get to go to heaven without ever dying. Somebody's going to get to go without ever dying. Enoch got to go without dying. And there's going to be a group of people on planet earth when the Lord descends from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Are you sure you're going to go to heaven when you die? No, I may not die. Oh, I'm sure I'm going to heaven. I'm sure I'm going to heaven. I just may not have to die to get there. (laughs) Hallelujah, that's encouraging to me. Now, I'm prepared to die to go there, but I'd rather not. And I'm sure you'd rather not too. Changed. He, here's what he said, we shall all be changed. Not everybody's going to die, but everybody is going to be changed. All saved people, not all saved people will die. There will be a select group of saved people. I happen to think it'll be very small, a very small group. I can't put a number on it, but Jesus always indicated that as it was in the days of Noah, as it was with Lot in the time of Sodom, so shall it be when the Son of Man cometh. He asked the question, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? The answer to that is yes, but the built-in inference there is, it's not going to be that easy to find. It's not going to be a worldwide revival when Jesus comes back. There aren't going to be believers and churches on fire for God all over the world. It's just not going to happen. Every indication of the Bible is that there's going to be just a few, a remnant left. A remnant left. Some would call today what we have today a remnant. Uh, I think there's more than a remnant. By the way, and this may surprise some of you, we're not the only ones left. There are churches like this. Honey, there are churches better than this that are, that are as on fire for God as we are and some more speckled all over the place all over the place now the pessimist will say you know there aren't hardly anybody left compared to 50 years ago that's true 100 years ago that's true 2000 years ago that's true but there are still a lot of a lot left a lot left that are seeking god that are ser- I'm talking about saved people serving god faithful to god on fire that number is constantly dwindling but there will be some that will be left when the lord returns and those will never see death but they will be changed and we will be changed the dead and those that remain will all be changed at the same time We shall all be changed. It means to be transformed. That's what the word changed means. It means to be transformed. Trans meaning a cross. Form meaning to be made. And so we're going to be made completely different than we are now. Uh, It means to go from one thing to another. It's almost like a metamorphosis, if you will. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. uh, 5.17 says what? Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a 
new creature. Old things are passed away. Build all things are become new. How many of you believe that all things are become new? How many of you still have an old man inside of you? See? That means the transformation hasn't happened yet. Uh, we're all the way saved. We are, we're not stu stuck in the spiritual birth canal. We are born again. If we're saved, we are born again. And we believe here because it's what the Bible teaches that once born, always born. Once born again, always born again. You must be born again, but once you've been born again, you never have to be born again, again. And so, but we will be changed. There's a change that's coming. And the change that, that's coming is predicated on the change that's already happened. In other words, if you've never been changed, you'll never be changed. If you've not been changed already, you won't be changed then. Salvation doesn't kick in at the point of death or at the point of Jesus coming back in the rapture. Salvation happens when a person is saved, is born into the family of God. And there ought to be ample evidence of it every single day in your life that you are a child of God. You ought to sense the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, uh, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. He said, Christ lives in me. He liveth in me. And the E-T-H on there means it's the present continuous tense. That means he's constantly living in me. If God lives inside of you, there will be evidence. Your appetite will change, your desires will change, your demeanor will change. You'll have a glow on your face like Moses had on his. Maybe not all day, every day, but honey, it'll be there. You'll, you'll sense God holding you back when you'd be too quick and prompting you when you'd be too slow, when you'd hesitate. You'll, you'll sense him telling you, don't think like that, don't do that, don't go there, don't say that, don't talk like that, don't act like that. And then you'll hear him say, do this, say this, go here, act like this. That's what it means to be saved. To have God living inside of you in the person of his Holy Spirit. And if you never sensed that and you've never sensed it, you are not saved according to the word of God. Why are you bringing all this up? I thought you was preaching on the resurrection. Because if there was never a change, there's not going to be a change. Until there is a change here, there won't be a change there. Death doesn't change anything. It just seals it. If you're saved now, your salvation will be complete when you die. Or when you're raptured. If you're not saved now, your eternal destiny in the lake of fire will be sealed forever. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. All things. Even our body. In fact, Paul would say it like this, and we quote it, 2 Corinthians 5, 1. Go ahead and turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Y'all have to forgive me for not having my suit coat button, but... Uh, when, Sent it to the cleaners, came back, button popped off. Just, it's up there on the pulpit. Almost quit preaching, went home and changed. I thought, no, it's too late. They won't wait for me. So y'all just have to pardon me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, is that where you are? Verse number 1. Does he say, for if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, notice the wording, we have. We have. When is that? If I say I have something, what does that tell you time-wise? That I'm going to be getting it later? That I used to have it way back when? Or that I have it right now in the present? He said, for if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, notice the length, eternal in the heavens. God is prepared for you to die, for me to die, or for the rapture to happen. He's not going to have to scurry and figure out what body he's going to give us when, when we're changed. He's already got it. He has it now. I have a glorified body already. And honey, I ain't talking about this one. I have a glorified body already. We have a build, It's a building of God. It's a house not made with hands, and it's eternal 
in the heavens. And Paul said that whenever I lay this tabernacle down in death, he calls it sleep here because it's not going to last very long. Or when the Lord comes back and shouts, we're all going to be changed. We're, we're not all going to die, but we are going to all be changed. And when I say we, I'm talking about saved people, generally speaking, not us here. We may all die in this, in this building before that happens. So far, our brothers and sisters from yesteryear have. And with regard to this deathless transition and this change, we learn from our text that it will be, number one, sudden. It'll be sudden. Look at what he says in verse number 52. In a moment. Be with you in a moment. Be with you in a minute. <laughs> in a moment, he says, notice this phrase, in the twinkling of an eye. And then he says, at the last trump. That's not something that you can start to plan for when it begins to happen. The twinkling of an eye. That means no sooner than it starts, it's done. That's it. In fact, if you blink, you'll miss it. Now, I read that it takes one-thirtieth of a second to blink. Let me time it. Yep, one-thirtieth of a second to blink. It, it takes one-thirtieth of a second to blink. A twinkling of the eye takes one ten-thousandth of a second. I'm not sure how they measure all of this, but I'm assuming it's right. And assuming it's right, there would be over 333 twinkles of an eye to one blink of an eye. Turns out, you can miss a lot if you blink. In fact, you could miss as many as 333 twinkles every time you blink. Uh-huh. You know my eyes twinkling to you right now. You missed it because you blinked. It, it twinkled 333 times just then. Turn, <laughs> it turns out you can miss a lot when you blink. My point is this. It's going to be sudden. In a moment, he said, not in the blink of an eye, but in the twinkling of an eye. Twinkling. At the, last, at the last trump. Now that's confused some people there. How much time? We ain't got time for it. So I'll leave it with that. That's confused some people there, the last trump. They, some have, have erroneously taken this to mean that it's the last trumpet of the angel. You know, the seven angels in Revelation chapter 8. And uh, he says, and there were seven angels, and they were given seven trumpets. And the seven angels that had the seven trumpets prepared to sound. And in chapters 8 and 9, and then finally in chapter 11, in verse number 15, the seventh angel sounds. And some have placed the sounding of that seventh angel's trumpet, the last trumpet of the seven, in the middle of the tribulation, and there, and there was born the mid-trib rapture. The problem is, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 are related Neither of them have anything to do with angels blowing trumpets in the Revelation. Chapters 8 through, through, through 11. 8, 9, and 11. There's no trumpets blown in 10, I don't think. But it has nothing to do with that. In fact, this, this one calls it, what does he say? At the last trump, right? Well, they say that's the last trump and there's no more trumps in the Bible. And that's true. There's none, none others recorded, Okay. So I guess we could come to that conclusion if that's all we had, but that's not all we have. So trumpets are given as signals. That's what they're for, to signal something. Sometimes trumpets would signal the beginning of something. Sometimes they would signal the end of something. And they were very distinct. So that everyone in Israel, and they were primarily for Israel, there's only two trumpets for, for church-going folk. Amen? There's only two trumpets from church-going folk, and really there's only one. It's just mentioned two times, and it's this one, and it's mentioned again in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, but we'll look at that in a moment. And even that is, never mind. I don't want to get off too far. I study a lot, y'all. <laughs> okay, 
And so you have 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you have 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Those two are no doubt related because they're talking about the same thing contextually. How do you know if something's related? The context will be talking about the same thing. If the context has changed, we have to assume that the wording in the context, even though it may be similar wording, is talking about what's in that context, not what's in some other context somewhere else. Does that make sense? And so what, what did the first trumpet signify in the book of the Revelation? It signified the wrath of God, the outpouring of the wrath of God, the judgment of God from heaven coming to planet Earth. It's called the tribulation, y'all. It's a tribulation trumpet. And so the seventh trumpet, which is the last from the first, is the, it signifies the end of something right there. But it has to do with tribulation. It has nothing to do, and it has to do with an aspect of tribulation, and you have to read the context of Revelation 8, 9, 10, and 11 to get that. And there it talks nothing about rapture, nothing about the church, nothing. In fact, we haven't heard from that since Revelation chapter 3. The church has been gone for five chapters by the time we start getting trumpets up in there. So these are a whole different set of trumpets. Not only that, if you were to go to Revelation 8, and you would see that seven trumpets were given to seven angels, and the seven angels that had the seven trumpets prepared to sound. Who's sounding the trumpets? The angels are. And he talks about the voice of the trumpet, which is just another word for sound, and the angels are sounding. Okay? So angels are blowing trumpets for these chapters in this space in Revelation chapter 7. You've got seven angels with seven trumpets, seven angels blowing the seven trumpets that they have. But here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, we shall, all be, we shall not all sleep, but shall, we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised. Okay, and then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he said, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Now, there's an angel mentioned there, and it's talking about his voice, the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of what? 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. The voice of the archangel, he said, And the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel. Y'all turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I don't want you to take my word for it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16. It is the trump of God. Are you there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, comma, with the voice of the archangel. Three different things going on here. And with what? The trump of God. Not the trump of an angel, not the trump of a tribulation angel during the tribulation in the book of the Revelation. That's a different, completely different set of trumpets. You have nothing to do with the church over there. Nothing. There, the church isn't mentioned in there. It's not alluded to in there. Everything there is about Israel. God is interested in Israel. And he's defeating the Antichrist and battling the forces of the devil on earth that are unleashed in their full power. He's calling Israel back home. And he's using trumpets to do it. Trumpets that they understand, that they get, speaking a language that they understand because they've been speaking it their entire uh, existence. It's not a language I want to be fluent in because it hurts. It's bad. And bad things are happening to Jewish people. But they understand that language. Okay. It's going to be sudden, is my point, the last trump. What trumpet is that? It's not the tribulation trumpets of Revelation. It's a church trumpet. It signals the end of, the, the end of an age, the end of an era or era. And what is that era? It's the church age. It's the church era. It's gone. It's called in Romans chapter 11, the fullness of the Gentiles. It ends with a trumpet sound, the trump of God. Not trumpets that were delivered to seven angels that they might sound with them, but with the trump of God. Does that make sense? Did I confuse everybody? Because that wasn't my intent. Okay, so it's going to be sudden. What are we talking about? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, it's going to be sudden. Then, too, it's going to be selective. This is not for everyone. Only a select group of God qualified are, are God qualified to be involved in this deathless transition and change. He says this in verse number 51 of our text in 1 Corinthians 15. 
Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Notice his repeated use of the word. What's the pronoun that he uses here? The pronoun. You help me. Where's my English teachers at? Where are my students at? Pronoun. We, we, we. We, we. <laughs> okay. The, um, and so he continuously uses this word, we. And to find out who the we are that he's talking about, we have to back up to verse 50 where he says, Now this I say, brethren. Okay. And so he's talking to his brothers and sisters in Christ. We establish that the word brethren is not, it, and y'all ain't going to love me for this no more, but the word brethren is not gender specific. <laughs> it's, a gender, it's a gender neutral term. It means save people. It's talking about brothers and sisters. They're called brethren. That means if you're a girl and you got saved, you're in with the brethren. <laughs> Ooh, somebody shout amen, help me. You know, I mean, my, my other button's going to come off here in a minute. <laughs> All right. He said, now this I say brethren. Okay, it's a, new, it's a neutral term that is talking about saved people that he's talking to here. He's writing to saved people. Not only men can get saved. Okay. And so he said, now this I say, brethren. And then he says, we, he's talking to the brethren. That means he's talking to saved people who are still alive during that time. Lost people have no part in this because lost people have no part in Christ. It's going to be sudden. In order to be changed, in order to be caught up, you have to be saved. So it's selective. It's going to be sudden, it's going to be selective. And then finally, it's going to be Satisfying. He says this, For the trumpet shall sound. Are you with me? And the dead in Christ shall be raised, notice, incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. Does that sound good to anybody? Does that sound satisfying to anybody? And this mortal must put on... This ain't even a, a comic book. This is the Bible. This is the kind of stuff you can read in comic books. Is that true, Daniel? Do they talk about immortality and stuff like that in the comic books? I mean, you can read that in a comic book. But here it is right here in the Bible, talking about the incorruptible, talking about immortality. Immortality. This is the kind of things that many of us imagine when we are children. And some imagine it beyond childhood. This happens before the dawn of the millennium, which means that for a thousand years, it happens right before the millennium, seven years before, ten years, whatever it is, we have new bodies. So that means that for 1,000 years, you and I who are saved will live right here on earth in superhuman bodies in glorified bodies right here on earth i mean i enjoy life here i can't imagine during the millennium when the conditions out there change and i have a superhuman body a glorified body an incorruptible body an immortal body imagine never getting sick never getting injured never getting never having joint pain or back problems, never growing old, never being worn out, never having toothaches or neck aches or headaches or back aches or any other kind of aches. Now, stop imagining. Because though we're not sure when, at some point, according to what Paul is, revel is, is revealing to us here, he's unfolding this mystery to us, at some point, this will be a reality. This will be a reality. I don't know why more preachers aren't preaching on this kind of stuff. I mean, you and I who are saved got something to look forward to. It's going to be unbelievable. No aches, no pain, invulnerable, immortal, incorruptible, strong. Because he said it's sown in weakness, it is raised in power. <laughs> power! Yeah, I mean, it's going to be good. It'll be sudden, it'll be select, and it'll be satisfying. And so the scriptures here provide it for us 
enlightenment. It turns the lights on. I know what's coming. Hey, I don't understand all the ins and outs of it, but the part that I kind of have a little bit of a grasp on, I'm excited about it. And we're going to talk about this next week, but we're going to talk about excitement. You ought to be excited about what's going to happen. We ought to be excited about it. I know it's hard to be excited about what's happening, what's going to happen, when we're too busy pouting about what is happening. We need to quit pouting. We need to get more in the book. Hey, can I encourage you to turn the news down and turn the Bible up? And I encourage you to spend, as, as, a, as a child of God, now this isn't unreasonable, this is not an unreasonable request. Can I encourage you, can I challenge you? I can't change you, but I can challenge you to spend more time in the Bible than you do in the news. And that's all news put together. More time in your Bible than in the news. It will revolutionize your life, it'll change your life. People think I'm strange because I don't know that the world's coming apart. My world's fine. They say, well, you know, you're awful protected there because you don't hardly ever leave. I said, yeah, amen. Amen, I'm protected by God. Well, you know, we ought to know more about what's going on in the world. That's what's infecting the church. People are more interested about, about what's going on out there than they are about what's going on in here. They will lie to you. God never will. God will never lie to you. When Every time you turn on the news, you may get something that might be a little bit helpful, but you're going to get a whole lot of garbage with it too. Every time you open your Bible, it's garbage. It's the garbage-free zone. It's the junk-free zone. You don't have to pause it. You don't have to fast-forward through the commercials. You don't have to close your eyes when you look at the news anchor lady on the conservative channel. They don't have sense enough to put clothes on before she goes to work. Y'all help me now. Some of you are spending way too much time in that junk and not near enough time in your Bible, and it shows. Not in, all, not in the Wednesday night crowd. I'm preaching to the... Take a lot. Okay, I got notes here. They don't get me in trouble. Here it is. The Scriptures provide for us enlightenment. Enlightenment concerning our problem. Hey, we have a problem. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Did you know for every problem we have, God has a solution? He's going to change us. We're going to get a new body. We're not suitable for heaven as we are because of our natural bodies. They're tainted and they're temporary. But thank God that though they are tainted, they, tainted, they are temporary. Remember when God sent, and we're done by the way, when God sent Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, do you remember the reason he gave for that? And he said an angel with a flaming sword that turned every way to guard what? Not the Garden of Eden. There was a tree in there he was guarding. The tree of life. And here's what he said, lest they take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. You know why Jesus came to this earth? There are many stated reasons in the Bible, but here's what he said, that they might have life. That they might have life. He came that we might have life. Well, why didn't he just let them go and eat of the tree of life if that's all he wanted them to have life? Because he didn't want them having that kind of life. That was a corruptible life. They would have lived forever in fallen state if they had eaten of the tree of life. That's what God said, lest they take of the tree of life and live forever in this, in this condition. We have to send a redeemer. Guess what tree is going to be in the eternal state that we can eat of all we want to? The tree of life. It's there. You, you won't find the tree of life until you get all the way to the end of the book of the Revelation. And boom, it pops up again out of nowhere. No, it, it didn't pop up out of nowhere. It was there the whole time. God never starts anything. He doesn't finish. You know why? You know, why, why do you think he put an angel there to guard the tree of life? Why didn't he just destroy it? He ain't done with it yet. We get to eat it. We get to eat of that tree of life in glorified bodies. Amen. I kind of want to sing that, I'm going to live forever. I'm going to die, no, never. Jesus died on the tree for me, and I'm going to live forever. Amen. And so the Scriptures provide for us enlightenment concerning our problem and enlighten, enlightenment concerning God's promise. Here's God's promise, Christian, to you. You're going to be changed. 
Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God, but you're going to be changed. And this change will be sudden, it will be selective, and it will be satisfying. All right. Let's pray briefly as Joshua comes to read our missionary letter. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of the word of God. Thank you for showing us this mystery. In Jesus' name, amen. Does anybody know how to glue buttons back on? <laughs> Sew it. Woo! No wonder it popped off. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I'm happy. I'm not happy my suit broke, but, broke, but I'm happy. Good evening, everyone. I'll be reading the um, I'll be reading the missionary letter from the Norton family in Aviano, Italy. And for reference, they give a lot of time things. So this was in March and April of this year. Dear friends and family, we found ourselves in Bonner's Ferry, Idaho, today near today a small town near the Canadian border. We arrived back in the U.S. less than eight weeks eight weeks ago. After just a few days to get everything packed in the van that the Lord had given us, we set out on our journey to visit churches across America. The first part of our journey started in Alabama and has taken us to Kentucky, Illinois, Missouri, Oklahoma, Texas, Arizona, Utah, Oregon, Washington, and now Idaho. In the next few weeks, we will be in Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wisconsin, Illinois, and finally back to Chattanooga, Tennessee for a short stop at Bimmy. We are so thankful for our supporting churches that have visited and the new churches that have allowed us to present God's call in our lives. The road is often long and sometimes the van seems very small, but we have been so encouraged by churches and the people that we have met along the way. Some are old friends and some we have met for the first time. There is a tie that binds us and that is Jesus Christ. We are very humbled to have this privilege to meet and spend time with each one of you. Thank you so much. I want to take you back to Slovenia and Italy for a moment to bring you up to date on all that has occurred. When we left off in our last prayer letter, we had one month left before returning to the United States. During that last month, we are thankful that we had the privilege to witness the salvation of three young adults in Aviano. Two have already returned to the United States, and we are thankful for the short time we had with them. One young lady accepted Christ in her first week of arriving at Aviano, and I would ask prayer for her as the folks that remain in Aviano work to disciple her. God has also answered prayer in providing the first armed missionary to stand in our place while we are in the United States. We are thankful for Brother Chris Parker's willingness to help us with this need. Brother Parker was instrumental in the salvation of Brother and Miss, Mrs. War many years ago in Rota, Spain. We know that he will be a great blessing to the folks in Aviano. Please pray for him, as it has been a short time since his wife has gone to be with the Lord. In Slovenia, we said our goodbyes. As we did so, the one question that was asked was, will you come back? While we have no promise of tomorrow, we know that God has called us to serve him on this field, and by faith we are going to return. Already, we have many new churches that have promised to pray, and four new ones that have committed to support the work. We believe that God will provide our needs. In, yeah, in Trieste, Italy, we were able to meet with Eduardo and Luz one last time. We were able to spend time with his family and share what God is doing. Again, the question and concern was, will we return? By faith again, we answered, yes. God is working and our labor is not in vain. In due season, there will be a harvest. We sow in the hope of the harvest that God will bring in the hearts of the people of Slovenia and Italy. As we close, we cannot say thank you enough for God's work through us to God's work through you to us as a family. Please continue to pray for the US military folks and the people of Slovenia and Italy. We would also ask to pray for our safety as we travel. We also pray that we might be a blessing as we travel from church to church, for our desire is to encourage others in their service for God. Finally, I would ask you for our families that remain in the U.S. The older I get, the more I recognize their sacrifice 
and I am so thankful for them. I do not feel worthy of their love that is shown through the sacrifice to the, for the Lord, uh, the Nortons. N-O-R-T-O-N. All right, thank you for that, Joshua. Remember, I mentioned on Sunday that on the 26th of this month, which is the last Sunday in the afternoon service, we will observe the Lord's Supper together. And then we have the baby table out here for Jessica and Cody and baby Emily. And then also we have a family day on the 4th of July. And we're going to bring stuff for the grill and sides and dessert and modest clothes to get wet in that will not be transparent when they are hit with water, if you want to play in the water. Now, that's not compulsory, uh, but mainly for young people, but sometimes everybody likes to get involved. So, all right. All right. I think that's it by way of announcement. Um... No, Brother Greg, were y'all wanting to make an announcement tonight, or? Okay. Amen. Congratulations. Baby girl. Baby girl. Yeah, that's what we were, we were praying for, so. Okay, very good. So, Brother Jason and Brother Greg both have an unspoken, and the Ashes are having a girl, and so that's going to be Chloe's little sister. All right. Good. So, it's a lot of girls. Everybody's having all three of them. Woo! Okay, so the Ashes baby girl, Brother Greg, has an unspoken. And then Brother Jason has an unspoken as well. And Brother Jason's schedule, you'll recall, changed so that now he is here on Sundays and out on Wednesdays. Yes, ma'am. Continue to pray for William. And then for Donna Robinson, because I don't think Cheryl's here. No, they're not here tonight. Robinson, and then Jose Gonzalez asked for prayer for his mom. I did send the message out um, earlier this evening, but. His mom's traveling to Mexico because his grandparents are old and sick. He need help, so we can ask for prayer for the first family, basically. His mom traveling mercy. Okay, so we'll continue to pray for William, the 18 year old young man that has cancer in his leg, and they're trying to trying to treat that without having to amputate his leg. So let's continue to pray for him. And then Brother Jose Gonzalez, his mom is traveling to Mexico, or has traveled to Mexico City to help his grandparents, her parents. They're elderly and their uh, health is not good. So he's asked that we pray for them and their health and also for uh, his mom's traveling. Did you mention a third thing? Donna Robinson, Donna Robinson right. And she's the one that uh, Sister Cheryl Sowell oftentimes mentions that had the tumor on the brain, cancerous. They removed 80% of it, and they were treating the other 20% with, uh, with radiation. 
open to be able to shrink it. And she still has several weeks of that to go, and then they'll recheck it and see how the treatment worked. All right, Brother Don, we still on for tomorrow. Your COVID test came back, you're okay. And okay, well, good. And so that's at what time in the morning? Be there at nine. Be there at seven, surgery at nine. Okay, so pray for Brother Don, Miss Brenda. He goes in for the heart valve replacement surgery tomorrow. He goes in at 7 a.m. And the surgery is scheduled for 9 a.m. And that's at St. Luke's in the Woodlands. All right, so we'll pray for him. And pray for Miss Brenda. Uh, Miss Brenda has been trying to take care of her daughter who's been in the hospital, two different hospitals, over the last uh, 10 days, almost two weeks. She just got discharged from the second hospital. She's here through the surgery tomorrow, and then uh, everything goes well. She heads back to um, Abilene tomorrow afternoon. And she's still got some complications. They were able to do some things to help her. Becky is her name. Please, please continue to pray for her. And then I know Miss Brenda has to be uh, wore out because she spent many nights in the hospital with her trying to help her. And then the regular stuff she's got. And then plus Brother Don uh, with the heart valve replacement and all of that. So I know it's been a lot on, on you. And so let's pray for her. Pray that the Lord will give them both a good night's rest tonight. And, uh, yeah, that's awful early in the morning. So pray the Lord will give them a good night's rest tonight. Becky got any help? Yes, did they get any help? She still has issues, though, and not a lot of answers. All right. Miss Sheila? Amber Soul today. Amber Soul today. Woo! Amen. All right. All right. Yeah. Good. Praise the Lord. So, did they come pick it up already, or? Oh, really? So they bought it, and isn't it? Nice. They did. They bought the Marshall shoulder. They did. They sold it, and it stays right where it's at. Brother Mark didn't buy it from you, did he? <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So the, the Morrises... Trailer sold... Camper trailer. All right. Brother William. Okay, Miss Lisa has surgery come Monday. On Monday the 20th. Sister Lynn? Unspoken. Unspoken. One unspoken from Miss Lynn. Bethy? Four unspoken. Okay, four unspoken for Bethy.
Brother Richard. Two unspoken. Brother Richard's got two unspokens. Joshua. Joshua's four unspokens, Isaac's three, and what was the other? For him and Bruce in Wyoming. For him and Bruce in Wyoming. Brother Jake. Uh, Pastor, I have a uh, uh, praise, the uh, army boy, you remember? Uh, her name was uh, uh, Elizabeth, and she was operated on her knee. And uh, right after that, uh, she was in, in rehab, and she had a call the husband as a prayer, right? And uh, she was. Uh, the healing was uh, very good, and she's now out from the rehab, and she's now uh, walking by herself. So, uh, the neighbor would like to thank also the church for praying. Okay, and her name was Elizabeth. Elizabeth, that's that was your neighbor. Yeah, that's right. And she had a leg surgery, the knee surgery, was in rehab. Rehab went well, she's out, she's walking on her own, she's doing much better. for their safety while they're there and their safe trip back home. Joel? Um, pray for me, my mom, and my brother, Ruben, as we're both I think in the community, and with my sister in downtown Houston. Did you say you, you are moving to downtown Houston? Yes, sir, with my sister. Wow. Okay, so Joel Rubin and Joel's mom are moving and with your sister? Yes, sir. To downtown Houston. Okay, when is this going to happen? Sure. Okay. All right, we'll pray for, for you guys on that. Is that going to impact your ability to come to church? I don't know yet. I'll have to talk to my mom. You used to be working up here, right? Most likely not. My mom says she might not be able to take me to work. What about Ruben? Ruben might be able to. Ruben, it looks like he might be staying at the job right now, but we're not sure. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll pray for you. Miss Anna? Pray for our unsafe family members and friends. Thank you, and support. Unsafe family members and friends, and then also two unspokens for Miss Anna.
Daniel. Uh, a couple of things of praise. Jasmine appears to be getting better uh, from the treatment of Dr. Gaber. Um, and uh, one unspoken, and also I have an interview on Friday with a company that, humanly speaking, is a long shot. Okay, so Jasmine's been ill. He had to take her to urgent care last week. She's, uh, the doctors gave her some treatment, and she's doing much better now. So praise the Lord for that. And then also Brother Daniel has one unspoken. And then he has an inter a job interview on this coming Friday day after tomorrow, Friday. And he says, it's a long shot, humanly speaking. Just pray that God's will be done. in Saskatchewan, Canada that are attempting to get that church building. Let's continue to pray for them. And our missionaries, the Claypools to South Tomei and Principe, they're here uh, in, the, in America for furlough. And then the Stewart, Paul Stewart, Lisa, are here on furlough as well, and we should be seeing them probably in November. All right. All right, if that's all, then we'll go ahead and pray for these. And... Uh, Brother Greg, I'll ask that you start us off, and then Brother Don, you pick up where Brother Greg leaves off, le uh, leaves off, and then I'll finish us out tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we've had to come into your house, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for revealing this great mystery that uh, we're all going to be changed, to be given glorified bodies, to be like you, Lord, and where we, uh, we look forward to that day, Lord, we don't know when it will be, but we're very grateful for it. And, you know, I want to pray for our lost family members and friends. Lord, if nothing changes, Lord, we know that they're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire, Lord, and we know that that's not your will. You're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would draw on them and grant them repentance to acknowledge of the truth. Lord, I thank of my cousin Brent, my uncle Brent, my uncle Randy, the pastor's uncle Randy. Lord, all of us have lost family and friends that we care deeply about, Lord, and we just pray you'll be merciful to them and that you will show them their need for salvation. Lord, that you'll save them. Lord, I want to pray for the Norton family. Uh, Lord, we thank you for uh, the great work that you're doing through them. And, and Lord, we thank you for this young lady that got saved. Lord, we pray for her that uh, you would continue to work in her life and help her to grow as a young Christian. Lord, we pray for the people there in, in Slovenia and Italy and the U.S. US military. Lord, that you had softened our hearts to uh, receive the truth of the gospel, Lord, that they'd be saved. Lord, I also want to pray for the various unspoken prayer requests that were mentioned tonight for mine and for my brothers. For Miss Lynn's unspoken, for Bethany's four unspokens, for Brother Richard's two unspokens, for Joshua's four unspokens. Isaac's three unspokens. 
Lord, for Miss Anna's two unspokens, for Brother Daniel's unspoken prayer requests. Lord, you know each and every one of these needs. We just pray that you would meet those needs according to your wisdom, according to your goodness, according to your riches. Lord, we know that there's nothing too hard for you. Lord, we know that your grace is sufficient for the need. Lord, I also want to praise you and thank you for uh, letting us know that we're, we have a baby girl. And, and Lord, we thank you for answering that prayer. Lord, this is what my wife and I have been asking for, that Chloe would have a little sister. And we, we thank you for that. We praise you for that. Lord, we also want to pray for um, uh, William, who's got this surgery. And... Lord, just pray that you would help him uh, to recover from the cancer. For Miss Donna Robinson, who's still got the treatments ongoing, Lord, we just pray that you would help her. Lord, we also want to pray for our brother Jose's mom. Uh, she's traveling to Mexico, Lord. We just pray that you would keep her safe on her travels and, and guide them, Lord. Lord, we pray for her. Brother Don's upcoming heart surgery. Lord, we pray that you give the doctors uh, uh, wisdom. You guide their hands, Lord, that uh, he would be able to get the surgery that he's been needing for a while now. And everything would go smoothly. And Lord, you continue to take care of him and bless him. And, and for Mrs. Triber, Lord, we pray that you would give both of them some so much needed rest that they'd be able to get the sleep that they need tonight and, and to wake up tomorrow uh, refreshed and, and able to uh, to get to the hospital, Lord. And, and Lord, we pray, we pray for their uh, their daughter, Becky. Lord, we, we still don't know all the, uh, the answer as far as what's going on with her. She's been struggling, Lord. We just pray that you would help her. Lord, if it would be your will that you would heal her. Lord, we just pray for your will to be done in her life. Continue to draw her to yourself. Lord, we also want to praise you and thank you that the Morrises were able to sell their camper. Lord, we know that they've been trying to do that. And Lord, we thank you for, for meeting that need. And Lord, we also want to pray for Miss Lisa Talia Farrow, her surgery is upcoming, and Lord, just pray that that would go well, and she would get the, the she would get the, the help that she needs there. And you'd be with the doctors. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for loving us, for caring for us, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us to be ever mindful of what's going on in the Bible that we did not be so focused on what's going on out in the world or in the news, Lord, that we would be focused on you. Thank you, Paul, for your Jesus. Father, good to be in your house tonight, and thank you for the joy of being here and hearing preaching and uh, the coming of Christ and Lord. Father, that he might make 
correct the decision. I pray and thank you, Lord, for the request tonight. I pray for Harold and Kathy Peters, Lord, for Kathy for her injury, Lord, that she might heal her shoulder, Lord, the injury she's had, and Effie, Lord, to help her with her condition, Lord, it's difficult uh, being blind and, and very well wheel, uh, wheelchair bound, Lord, but she wants to be in church and, and, and sing, and I pray, Father, just give her strength and give healing in that family. Help Harold that he's working on his new job, that he'll get it, and that he'll be able to help provide for the family. Uh, I thank you, Lord, for, for them and for their testimony. I pray for Eddie Castro, Lord, not here tonight. The Lord has been suffering from his back. I pray that these uh, situation that he's been dealing with with the insurance company that he'll get the benefits he needs to be able to take care of his needs that they can relieve the pain and the aches from his back Lord, that they can sleep good at night to be able to get around more for him and also for Harry Maxwell uh, with his hearing Lord is difficult but help him that he might have the ability to hear better I know he likes to be in church he used to be very very faithful here and now being older Lord it's hard for him to get around Lord just take care of him and his wife we thank you for his wife being here last Sunday pray, Father, also for Brother Greg as prepares this trip to New Orleans here in August. I pray, Father, that a lot of preparation uh, before this uh, takes place. And I just pray be with him as he uh, works towards this and also with his wife expecting, Lord, we, we pray your name uh, for the child being a girl, Lord, but uh, we know that uh, they're happy about that. And I just pray, Father, just comfort that family. We thank you for Greg for his work with knock, door knocking and desire working in the church with the sound. I just pray, Father, just to strengthen that family and take care of them as they grow in you. I pray and thank you, Lord. Praise Lord for more to see Bill Seller trader. Uh, Lord, uh, I pray, Father, now they work towards the same place they want, but thank you. The opportunity that, that, that your will will be done and that they'll be able to have a larger home to be able to help uh, enjoy it and still have family around. And Lord, I thank you for just answering for it. Right. Also for the prayer family, Lord Canada, Lord, that the money will come in and to be able to attain this church. They're trying to get, Lord, it will be a real blessing because they've been meeting in their home for at least over five, six years, Lord. And I just pray, Father, what a blessing is to have this building available to them. I pray, Father, that the funds will come in that they'll be able to purchase this building and rejoice and thank you for answering your prayer and I'll be there. I pray also for our missionaries that are on for the Lord and Claypool to Stewart, Lord, as they're traveling here now in the States, Lord. I know they've been in other countries all, for a long time and get back in here, it's not as easy as it used to be with the gas prices so high, but I pray, help them, that they'll be able to get around and be able to meet the needs, uh, uh, meeting with churches and giving them a report, Lord, and having time to visit with family and mother here. I pray also, Lord, for Dan Mosley, Lord, as he had an interview coming up, I just pray. Father, now that you make things work out, that uh, if all possibilities, that uh, even when things don't look as good as they should, Lord, you can do all things. And I pray, Father, as Daniel desired to seek for a more secure job, and, and, and that you work this out, that you continue to teach here, and to be able to have a job that can provide for the family. And I thank you, Lord, for wife doing better. I just thank you for this day, and thank you for our pastor, and for his faithful priest's word. And we'll give you the honor and glory of Jesus. Lord, it is a privilege to be able to pray, to call on your name, to see heaven's help for earth's problems, issues. Lord, it's just a joy to know the Lord Jesus Christ, the indwelling Holy Spirit, our Heavenly Father, that cares about us, loves us, and commands us to pray, encourages us to pray, promises to answer when we pray. We pray tonight for Isaac and Bruce there in Wyoming as they work, as they grow, as they mature, as they learn. I pray that this would be used of you to teach them, to mold them into to men, young men that would be able to work, to take care of families eventually, to serve God with all that they have, that they would learn that uh, the value of hard work and of labor, and that that would translate not only into their manual, their physical labor, but also in their spiritual labor, to know God, to walk with God, <clears throat> and to be men of God. I pray for Mary and Terry as they are in Europe traveling and for safety while they're there and then safety on the way back home. We pray for Joel and Reuben and their mom who plan to move downtown with their sister. And Lord, that may impact Joel's ability to come to church here. And Lord, we love him here. We know he likes to be here. It's always good to see him on Wednesday nights. 
And Lord, we just ask that your will would be done. Lord, no doubt things are going on that require this, and at least it seems that way now. And so we just pray that your will would be accomplished and that you would provide, that you would meet needs, that you would uh, answer prayer, and Lord, that you would help them. And I thank you for Joel. Lord, we're so grateful for your goodness to us, how you love us, how you listen to us, how you lead us. We call unto you because you said call unto me. You promised to answer us, to hear us, to answer us, and to show us great and mighty things which we know not. We know it because you revealed it to us in your word. And so, Lord, all these prayer requests now, we leave before the throne of grace that you may answer them as you see fit. We wait patiently for your answers. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, church.